Uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I think I'm just going to go right into this then. <laughs> just a quick outline. Uh, the discussion today is supposed to cover why TBMs are required in Himalayan projects, the unique uh, technical challenge presented by the Himalayas, brief history of TBM use in the region. I'll provide some details on uh, the projects that have uh, got, been done in the Himalayas already with tunnel boring machines and then discuss some of the successes and failures on those projects and finally move on to give some uh, suggestions on what uh, might be done to get more successes in future TBM projects in the Himalayas. Like I say, maybe we'll get through half of that. Start into why TBMs. India is the second most populous country in the world with 1.3 billion people approximately 17% of the rural population. It's ranked number three in electrical production with 4.8% of electrical production. But due to its large population, India is ranked 140th in the world in electrical production per capita. The uh, uh, electrical production has been growing at a rate of two to 10% a year while the population is growing at 2% per year. Obviously, we'd like to increase the rate at which we're in, uh, increasing electrical production. Today, there are about 300 million people in the country with no access to electricity, and about 800 million people are using traditional fuels like wood and coal for heating and cooking. And many of the country's water treatment plants are not ran full time due to shortages of electrical power. Um, I'd like to quote here uh, Rebecca Grinspan. She's the head of the United Nations Development Program and a former vice president of Costa Rica. She says, we need smart and practical approaches because energy, as a driver of development, plays a central role in both fighting poverty and addressing climate change. The implications are enormous. Families forego entrepreneurial endeavors, children cannot study after dark, health clinics do not function properly, and women are burdened with time-consuming chores such as pounding grain and hauling water, leaving them with less time to engage in income-generating activities. Further, it is estimated that kitchen smoke leads to around 1.5 million premature deaths every year globally. After gaining access to energy, households generate more income and are more productive and are less hungry. The importance of increasing electrical power generation from clean sources cannot be overstated. Uh, there's tremendous hydroelectric potential in the Himalaya. Currently, only about 17% of Indian electrical power is produced by hydroelectric and 59% is coal-fired. The total hydroelectric potential is estimated to be 84,000 megawatts from sources I read, but I saw higher numbers than this in an earlier presentation today. And most of that, of course, is in the Himalaya. The reason TBMs need to be used is because they are generally faster than drill and blast operations. Often they are very much faster. And in long tunnels with no intermediate access adits, the tunnel can only be worked from two faces, and there the advantages of TBMs are even greater. And this is often the case in the Himalaya where we have a lot of high cover which prevent the uh, creation of intermediate access adits where you could work the tunnel from four or six spaces. It's just too expensive to do when you have that much cover over a tunnel. So over the years, uh, TBM technology has improved and recently improved specifically from some lessons learned on uh, TBM projects in the Himalaya and other high uh, mountains. In addition, uh, direct TBM performance in the Himalaya has been proving on recent projects. Contractors, tunneling crews, site job, uh, sorry, job site managers and others are gaining experience on each job we complete in the Himalaya and this sets the stage for more success in the future. Um, so we turn now to the unique challenges presented by the Himalayan mountains. It's the youngest mountain range on earth. It's rising. It's still uh, rising at a rapid rate. In fact, double that of the Andes and six times that of the Alps. The geology is heavily folded, uh, meaning that in a single tunnel, we see multiple fault zones, and the faults can be very long. Often there's very high cover over the tunnels. This means tremendous rock stresses and uh, rock bursting and high pressure perched water and solids. The location of the hydro schemes are often very remote, meaning poor infrastructure, roads uh, with limited capacity, bridges which aren't capable of supporting the loads required to bring in a tunnel boring machine or hydroelectric components all have to be improved before we can carry out these projects. Uh, there often isn't sufficient power on the local grid to power a tunnel boring machine which can uh, require two to four megawatt of power 
So we often have to use uh, diesel generators, which means producing the power for the jobs is quite expensive. Furthermore, as with all remote tunneling projects, we have to build safe and sanitary camps to house and entertain the workers and provide uh, satellite-based global communications, and sometimes political instabilities in these regions can make security a primary issue. So we'll move on to a little bit of the history of uh, TBMs in the Himalaya. The first modern attempt to employ a TBM in Himalaya took place in 1989 when an open hard rock machine was delivered to the Dual Hosti project. Uh, the machine started boring, but progress was extremely low, slow. The uh, rock was very hard, very abrasive, and laboratory tests also confirmed that it was quite tough. It had a higher tensile strength than we were accustomed to seeing at Robbins, at least at that time. Um, cutter usage was extremely high. Uh, things got worse when a slab of rock came out from the side of the tunnel at one stage immediately behind the cutter head followed by an inrush of high pressure water and silt. In a short order, the TBM and backup was buried to about midway point of the, of the uh, tunnel with, with fine sands. And it took many days for that water to slow down enough for us to go back into the tunnel and start work on rescuing the machine. Uh, things move very slowly. Several contractors are on the job over the years. Uh, in fact, the tunnel was not completed for 18 years, and that's a pretty strong indication of the immense difficulties faced on completing that job, both for the TBM and for drill and blast methods. Um, we'll go back to this project a little later in the presentation. Following Dual Hosti, uh, which started in 1989, uh, in 2000, the Parbati Stage 2 project kicked off. Uh, it employed a secondhand open hard rock TBM for the main tunnel and a an, uh, 4.88 meter double shield for incline tunnels. Um, the TBM, the big TBM, was to be used to excavate nine kilometer head race tunnel. Now, 15 years later, the tunnel has not yet been completed. The TBM is still on the job site as of this lecture, and there are reports that it is to be used again. However, the 4.88 meter double shield TBM bored two 30 degree, 1.5 kilometer long tunnels for the pressure tunnels. Uh, that TBM work went quite well. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in a few slides. In 2006, top of Vishnu Vishnugad, a 520 megawatt uh, project, employed a 6.57 meter bore double shield to bore 8.6 kilometer head race tunnel. That TBM has been trapped several times and nearly as bad for the project. The main European contractor became insolvent and had to be removed for the project. The project recently retendered. The TBM remains on the job and is reported to be put to work again soon. In 2010, on the Kishinganja project, a 330 megawatt project in Jammu and Kashmir, a 6.8 meter double shield was used to bore 14.8 kilometers of tunnel. The tunnel was completed in 2014. Finally, a resounding success in Amalia for a TBM. Uh, hopefully, it's an indication of performance that we can achieve in future on other projects of the same type. Uh, now we're going to look at some details on these specific projects. Back to Dual Hasi just for a second. And bear in mind, when we discuss this now, that there was a 25-year-old TBM technology at work. They have evolved some since that day. Uh, it was intended to bore 6.75 kilo kilometers of the total 10.6 kilometer head race tunnel. Uh, 1989 open machine. Compared to a similar machine today, it had vastly lower cutter head power, less thrust. The cutters were of a lower capacity, lower diameter, and had much inferior ring uh, metallurgy compared to what the cutters would have today. In the end, over many years, uh, the machine was operated by many contractors, and the machine still excavated less than three kilometers of tunnel. However, the geological difficulties encountered in those three kilometers of tunnel are probably greater than we would normally see in 40 kilometers of tunnel in any other mountainous region with hard rock TBMs. Extreme hard and a, a abrasive rock required the disc cutters to be changed at a rate six times the original forecast. In addition to the immense cost for those cutters was the uh, dropped weekly advance because of the time taken to replace all of those cutters. Contractors originally forecast 400 meters per month of advance, which was not unusual at that time. 
the machine actually achieved 86 meters per month. The dural and blast averages for the project were even lower than that. The advance of the machine was completely stopped when a large rock slab suddenly broke from the tunnel, allowing this inflow and the silt uh, inflow. Uh, the inflow was actually estimated at 11 cubic meters per second. The silt buried the machine, and that was the beginning of the end. Though it was cleaned up, repaired, and operated again, it never made many more meters after that event. Now we'll move back to the Prabati project. Uh, it's a nine kilometer section of head race tunnel that's being driven by the 6.8 meter diameter open gripper machine. This is a used machine. Uh, overburden above the TBM section is high, as high as 1,400 meters and the rock is highly stressed. The job began about 12 years ago in 2003. Contractor purchased a refurbished TBM from a European contractor. The European contractor had to rebuild and modify the TBM before delivering it to India. Despite crossing several minor fault zones, operations initially went moderately well with production rates up to 520 meters a month. Parabody is a good example of limited geological information being available due to poor access along the alignment because of the high cover, making it impossible to retrieve core samples from tunnel depth. So maintaining knowledge of the geology ahead of the machine was possible only with a strict regime of probe drilling ahead of the machine from within the tunnel. There were four kilometers of tunnel being completed at at a location over 1,100 meter of cover, several rock bursting events occurred, damaging the machine and delaying the works. The rock bursting was accompanied by moderate to severe loss of ground, so ground support regime was upgraded to include, include ring beams, rock bolts, lagging sheets, and concrete backfilling. During the subsequent 50 meters of boring, the incidence of rock bursting increased to the point that at times they were almost continuous. At a routine probe hole, was put in at the 11 o'clock position, P1. The depth was 27 meters, and a minor ingress of water and silt was observed. A decision was made to drill a second probe hole at P2 at the 1 o'clock position on the face in order to gain further information on the geology and hydrology ahead of the face. During the night shift, the P2 probe hole operations went underway when the crew heard several cracking sounds emanating from the surrounding rock mass. Shortly after these events, the initial probe hole was observed to be discharging water and silt under very high pressure. It took the crew almost two and a half hours to seal the 51 millimeter hole using a mechanical packer attached to the probe drill. During these two and a half hours, approximately 180 cubic meters of silt and a greater volume of water were discharged into the tunnel while continuous rock bursting was occurring. Due to the high pressure and high volume of the discharge, an action plan was put into place. It was decided that the best course of action would be to drill the drainage holes to relieve pressure ahead of the tunnel face before a program of consolidation grouting could be undertaken. Drainage holes and grout holes were to be filled via standpipes. The standpipes were to be fitted with ball valve and pressure gauge and anchored by grouting into place prior to drilling. Third probe hole, P3, was drilled to a depth of 38 meters utilizing the standpipe arrangement. Although the location of P3 hole was adjacent to the P1 probe hole, Oddly, it did not encounter any water or silt. The next course of action was to attempt to drill a fourth hole, P4, which was to intersect P1 and provide a method to assist with draining the water through P1. It was drilled and it was fitted with a valve and regulate a pressure gauge and a, a length of 75 millimeter hose to allow drainage of the water into the TBM conveyor and hence into the muck cars to remove the water from the tunnel. Probe P1 was successfully intersected. Drainage operations started when unfortunately several more rock bursting events occurred. The pressure in the probe hole P1 gradually increased until it exceeded the 25 bar capacity of the gauge and minor inflows of silt water began to flow through the fissures and the rock mass close to the face. Further rock bursting fractured the rock mass surrounding the collar of probe hole P1, causing the rock to fall away and expose the hole behind, resulting in an inrush of water and silt again under very high pressure. The crew tried unsuccessfully for several hours to insert a packer to stem the flow, but with silt levels rising rapidly and rock bursting continually occurring, the tunnel was evacuated for safety. 
It was deemed impractical and unsafe to enter the tunnel, and flow rates gradually increased throughout the day until it finally reached a rate of 7,000 liters per minute. Over the following days, it slowed down and finally stabilized so a team could enter the tunnel, and they observed that the inundation had almost completely buried the TVM and back up, and silt and water were still flowing from the face. Pressure and discharge were reduced, so a crew was mobilized and managed to seal the probe hole by inserting a mechanical packer. The total amount of silt deposited during this event was over 14,000 cubic meters, and the cleanup operation took over two months. Very little has been done at the job uh, with the tunnel boring machine since this event. The machine was uh, partially repaired, cleaned up, and ready to go back to work. Another contractor has been brought onto the job, and the reports from the job site are that the machine will be put back to work in the near future. Fortunately for the power body project, things went a bit better on the incline tunnels. The 4.8 meter uh, double shield used to bore the 30 degree 1.5 kilometer inclines went up relatively well and the second uh, tunnel was done very rapidly, in part because it's possible when boring the first tunnel to know what the geology is at the subsequent tunnel, and also from within the first tunnel to pre-grout off the second and parallel tunnel. The second tunnel was completed in only 136 days, in fact. Also, of course, short tunnels like this tend to not go through more consistent geology than a long tunnel through multiple faults will. Uh, Top of on Vishnu God, uh, where the success or failure is yet to be written, uh, has a 11.3 kilometer, 5.6 meter ID head race tunnel. I take it, I'm out of tunnel. Five, okay. Uh, this double shield machine uh, started excavating in October of 2012 with a schedule which called for a completion of the tunnel by 2010. It hasn't made it. It's unfortunately been trapped at least three times by varying geology. In 2009, with 900 meter cover over the tunnel, the machine entered a fault zone. A large rock wedge came down in front of the machine and caused severe damage with 150 millimeter plastic deformation along the entire length of the forward shield. Uh, the day following the event, water and silt began to inrush into the tunnel. There seems to be a constant here that's developing, that first you get the rock, then you get the water. Uh, uh, they then made an effort to block and keep the water out of the shield and out of the tunnel, and they were measuring the pressure. The pressure came up uh, outside of the tunnel, and eventually two roof segments and the concrete segments behind the machine cracked, and the water came in through there at a rate of seven to 800 liters of water a second and fine material. When conditions allowed it, a bypass tunnel was made in order to treat the ground ahead of the machine and repair the machine again and move it forward. Unfortunately, it happened again. In February 2012, the machine was again trapped by similar situations, and once again, nine months later, in October of 2012, the machine was once again trapped for a third time in a similar situation. Um, the last event was reportedly dry, but then the water reportedly eroded the uh, sensitive fault gouge, and there followed a slowly increasing rate of water flowing into the tunnel through these faults. Um, Kishinganja is the success story. I'll cover that, I think, and call it enough for today. Uh, it's a 14 kilometer, 14.75 kilometer uh, head race part of the head race tunnel to be bored by a double shield machine. Uh, the double shield machine had a bore diameter of 6.18 meters. It was fitted with 19 inch cutters, a 311 kilonewton load. The machine had high power, high thrust, tapered shields, the largest highest capacity cutters available on the market. It was refitted with removable access doors to allow you to go in forward to do the bypass tunnels nearer the face. Uh, the tunnel lining was hexagonal with an internal diameter of 5.2 meters, so a good thick segment. TBM started boring in June 2010, and reportedly bypass tunnels were hand mined over the machine and forward at least three times, one with 650 meters of cover. The machine bypasses uh, hatches, and the shield did help accelerate that work. Boring of the tunnel was completed in May of 2014 in only 48 months for an average of 307 meters per month. In fact, the monthly average was probably closer to 400 meters per month if you eliminate the days and holidays in which there was no attempt to actually use the machine. 
Uh, machine had an impressive for the Himalayas, best month of 816 meters. Uh, the tunnel was reportedly completed somewhat ahead of schedule, I think 30 to 45 days ahead of its original schedule. The contractor TV assessed to experience and skill the tunneling crew and job site managers, as well as the bypass tunnel access hatches and experience of the miners which excavated the bypass tunnels. This project has not yet started. I think uh, I'm out of time. Another one or two minutes. Uh, then I'll just finish with a uh, quote by uh, Martin Knights. Uh, is the global leader for tunnel earth engineering sciences for Hal Crow and the past president of the International Tunneling Association. Martin said, I hope the success at Kishinganja will signal to clients that TBMs can be used to manage the construction of long tunnels to overcome the geological risks presented by the Himalayas. And I hope he's correct and that they do.